You are Locked On Rays, your daily Tampa Bay Rays podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Rays, your daily podcast covering everything Tampa Bay Rays from game analysis to player interviews. We've got you covered with all the latest news and insights. My name is Kevin Weiss. I'm Ulysses Sombrano. It's your boy, Evan Klosky. That's right. And the myth, the legend, bringing you expert analysis and passionate discussions about our beloved Rays. Whether you're a diehard fan who vividly remembers Longo's game, 162, just like us. Or you remember the early Devil Ray days of Wade Boggs or Carl Crawford. We're here to break down every play, every trade, and every milestone. In fact, this is our sixth season covering the Rays daily. And every season they've gone to the playoffs, hopefully again this year. Not looking so great, though. So grab your favorite Rays gear, settle in, subscribe to our Lockdown Rays YouTube channel and other podcast platforms. You can also find us on X and Instagram at Lockdown Rays. This episode is brought to you by Supply House. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to get parts fast. Shop for your next plumbing, HVAC, or electrical job and get fast shipping from coast to coast at supplyhouse.com. All right, Evan. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, a discussion that Ulysses and I had earlier this week, uh, we are hearing more reports and it is starting to gain groundswell. The forthcoming returns of Drew Rasmussen and Jeffrey Springs, they can't come back soon enough. Yep, we got a mailbag question on it from Tom McCann uh, that we answered earlier this week. Uh, basically, we want to pose that question to you. What do you think are reasonable expectations for both those two from the time they return until the end of the season. Do you mean like like performance wise, or do you mean performance innings, the whole nine yards, um, the whole game? Yeah, I mean, you know, Jeffrey Springs. I think you can imagine him inserting himself right back into the starting rotation. I would assume, and and. It was very convenient for the rain delay to happen in Jacksonville the other day where Jeffrey Springs was making a start. But I would assume that Jeffrey is going to make his return with the Rays after the team makes some sort of trade of whoever, you know, they clear a spot. Uh, So so I, I feel like that's once that happens, you can pencil Springs in for five innings you know, maybe get built up to six, but though, I mean, he's kind of built up, you know, he's been doing this for about a month now. Uh, he's been pretty consistent in where his numbers have been. He hasn't had a setback. So, you know, they're not going to just throw him out there to go, go eight some odd innings. But I think that when he comes back, he got him. And wh- whether he's the same guy or not, I don't know. There's probably going to be some sort of adjustment period. I'm, I'm sure he's going to have some, you know, glimpses of greatness. I'm sure he's going to get peppered once or twice. It's going to be an up and down thing, but it's 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 part of that, you know, reintegration process into into Major League Baseball and making himself whole again. Now, with Drew, and I've said this a while now, uh, there was a Buccaneers event last month, uh, a, a philanthropic event where drew actually came out and i was talking with him and he said that for this year the plan is to get him into a bullpen role that he said next year we'll be thinking about starting rotation again and, and building back up ultimately they said with the recovery process and how long it would take to kind of build himself back up especially because he didn't go through Tommy John, right? He's going through the, the internal brace procedure, mm-hmm. which brings you back a little quicker. And, um, you know, right. He's kind of, he, he did another inning on Wednesday. So that was, you know, he had 13 pitches. Then he did 16 pitches for him to get fully built up. You're probably looking at a September, early September type of return. Yeah. And for this team, and what they kind of need right now. And again, I would imagine that a couple of bullpen pieces, uh, you know, certainly there are some expendable pieces slash there are guys who can get shuttled back down to, to Durham if necessary. But I would imagine you can insert Drew right into that 
um, late inning high leverage role. And to me personally, I, and now, so the only thing that Drew told me, right, is that the, the plan is for him to go relief this year, work back into a starting position next, next year. So that's when I talked with Drew. Mm-hmm. Having said that, my own personal opinion, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to maybe think of a life of him as possibly a uh, future closer. I agree that. I agree with that. I like that idea. So, you know, yeah. I, I, like he's had two Tommy right. John surgeries previous yeah, to it, his professional career. He's had this issue pop up. They yeah. like doubled, tripled his innings in his workload. That might not be the craziest idea, especially, uh, when you have McClanahan back in the picks might be set on starters until another injury pops up. Of course. I mean, look two Tommy Johns and an internal brace procedure, right? At some point you got to have an honest conversation with drew like, Hey, one more elbow injury and you're probably done. Yeah. Like your, your career is done. The best way for us to like mitigate your, um, to look out for you and also possibly increase your wealth in the future to get to some sort of contract is to be a dominant reliever. And is that going to limit your ceiling of what you'd get on the open market? 1000%, right? I mean, go look at the Jeffrey Springs type contract versus the contract that Pete Fairbanks got. Right. But the contract that Pete Fairbanks got isn't, isn't maybe like generational wealth. Um, but, but it's certainly like, Hey, I can pass down this multi-million dollar home to my kids, right? Like I got, I got, I got uh, something in the bank there that my yeah. kids are going to be set up for life. And you know, whether their kids' kids are going to be set up, I don't know about that. But he's already kind of created a ripple down effect of like, hey, like this is, this is pretty good. Um, and, and you've got the option there with like Pete. I know Jason Adam um, could be traded. Sean Armstrong could be traded. So if you can just like. Put Drew in the in the bottom of the uh, back of the bullpen. I mean, if Jason Adam doesn't go, fellas, and you have a trident seven, eight, nine of Rasmussen, Adam, and Fairbanks, that's nasty. And I would put that three uh, with anybody else in the league. Really, you're shortening yeah. that game. Uh, yeah, and but it also gives you the ability if you want to try to trade Pete and max out on his value if somebody's willing to give you something True. Uh, or vice versa, Jason, even though I think that under the hood, I like what Jason's got maybe a little bit more than Pete. Uh, I'm not saying that Pete hasn't done really well. Obviously he has. It's just, you know, when looking at some of the the things that are viewable to the public, it just seems like Jason is pumping on all cylinders right now. And, and what they kind of, what, what's working right now is just like, it's, it's really nice theoretically you can slide Jason and Drew into like kind of a rotational closer role and you can trade Pete and then you got to find like a seventh inning guy, uh, which I think is a pretty easy fix for the Rays. So, you know, if you have like, I mean, Drew is throwing 98 to 99 already in the minors. So to me, he's got the live arm. You have the injury concerns, which by the way, so does Pete Fairbanks. Um, I just, to me, when factoring in his help, not his abilities, I think ideally he's a starter because he's really freaking good, you know? Um, but but when, when trying to be realistic and what this team needs moving forward, like into the future, they really need more pen help than starting pitching help. And that, you know, if, if injuries happen down the line and Boz goes down again and Pepio has a long-term injury or Taj does, you know, then you can always flirt with building Drew back up, right? Yeah. But, but I think that, um, you know, I, I think that that's all part of the equation. But long story short, I think you got the gist of what both of those guys, at least in 2024, yeah. what we can project. Yeah. A uh, couple things there. Uh, that certainly wouldn't be the first case of moving a starter to closer. It's happened many times in Major League history. The other thing, too, I brought up with Sean Armstrong – show previous success as an opener is that something that they could incorporate this season with drew and or springs where you have an opener in front of springs to get him back in the groove or is that kind of a moot point uh i to me like i don't know why you would mess with springs 
unless there was like a line, unless like a lineup was like righty, 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 and then like four lefties right on the back end, yeah, where it's like, okay, let's throw out a righty the first inning, let's hope it's one, two, three, and then we can get get to our lefty and at least give Jeffrey one less run through the top of the order with all those righties. Uh, unless it's something like that, I just believe that like, why would you mess with Springs? Why would you like he's like this isn't somebody you should tinker with. Yeah. And so maybe maybe instead of doing that opener, maybe they do, hey, you take the ball to start, but maybe we're cutting you off up three and two thirds, four and four innings, and then maybe we can take care of you that way instead of doing the bulk, uh instead of doing the no the opener then. Yeah, I, you know, or you know, look, I mean, injuries happen, right? We saw Pepio got like a I don't know, some sort of like spider bite, uh some, something like some weird injury and boom they had to call up like tyler alexander and you could slot drew rasmussen into that role if you had to it just into that opener role and you know you play it by ear i just um uh, ultimately i i would say this that whatever role that they bring drew in i would like it to be consistent yeah. i don't think with his injury history you should be throwing him all willy-nilly like if you're a reliever expect to come in later in the game so you have a routine and you can and you can prepare for the games in a certain way. Other than that, um, I, I, I also don't believe in screwing around with Jeffrey Springs and what he's got cooking. And I want him out there taking the ball in the first inning. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, we have more to discuss with Mr. Klosky, but first, Ulysses, we tell the audience something extremely, extremely important. That's correct. And people, guess what? This episode of Locked on Race is brought to you by Booking.com. Everybody, Booking. Yeah. yeah. That's right. With summer travel heating up, especially travel for baseball games, it's time to explore those U.S. cities you always secretly wanted to learn about. And yeah, we're talking about your rival cities. I know I haven't been to New York in a while, and I know that if uh, I wanted a good uh, tour guide, guess what? Mr. Klaus could be the guy to do that. And if I wanted to get the perfect place to stay, Booking.com is that place. From hotels that look over stadiums to family-friendly resorts, Booking.com so many choices across the U.S. You wouldn't believe. So today, get on that Booking.com uh, site or the app because the right stay can make you a fan of any U.S. city, even your rivals. Book today on Booking.com, on the site, or in the Booking.com app today. We also want to tell you about FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much, I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't seem like we want them to. But FanDuel lets me and others keep the sports going whenever I, you, everyone wants. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That is right, something for everyone, every day, all summer long. So, Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. It's All right. Cool. Yeah. Can we uh, can we have some fun with Evan? Because I, yeah. I need to Let's play Klosky on the Evan. clock. I need, to, I need to play Klosky on the clock this whole segment. So why don't we hit that intro, baby? Klosky on the clock. Klosky on the clock. Klosky on the clock. Klosky on the clock here. There you go. That's Very enough. Good. All right. Uh, you listen, you uh, entered us with the theme. You want to hit Evan with uh, your first fun question here? Yes. Uh, today, uh, Wednesday, <laughs> peek behind the curtain. On Wednesday <laughs> evening, on Wednesday evening, Zach Eflin pitched for the Rays. His next uh, start would be on July 30th against the Miami Marlins at the Trop. Will he make that start? If I had to guess, I'm going to say no. Would I be surprised if he did make the start? No, I wouldn't. But it's of my belief they got to clear the paint a little bit. They have a lot of starting pitching depth. It's a seller's market. They have what a lot of people want and not a lot of people can give it. He's making $18 million next year. I think that it would um, be a very understandable move to trade Zach Eflin with the correct price 
And I think that is probably the direction they would go. Uh, they have other options of people who they can trade also. Um, you know, if, if somebody wanted to take Zach Littell, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, uh, no, he won't. Fair enough. Oof. All right. Good. Uh, following up on that, Evan, if you were to make a podium of the three players on the Rays most likely to be traded by the trade line, one, two, three, who would those players be? Um, if I had to build a podium, one would be Ahmed Rosario. Two would be Sean Armstrong. And nobody said that uh, the returns had to be crazy in these deals. They're just deals. Um, yep. And I would say three would be Zach Eflin. Follow up to that. What? Who would be number four? Would it be Brandy or somebody else? Uh, I think it's then you're you're now talking about like a whole slew of ties, right? Because it, it like between Randy and Isak and Jason and Pete, it comes down to the fact of like not necessarily there's one leader in the clubhouse of who would get traded. It comes down to the fact of who out there is presenting me an offer that is so good that it makes me say yes. Mm. That and and so so there's not like an obvious option. It just comes down to I, to a degree. I think that like Eric Neander might like lay out all the cards on the table and say who's going to give me the best offer because I'm only choosing one of them. I'm not trading all these guys. I'm choosing right. one. What's Whoever the best gives offer? me the best offer is going to get their person. Everyone else is coming right back to me. Yeah. So so to that extent, I just don't believe in there being like a fourth place. I just think that there are, you know, there are like kind of like some obvious like I think Ahmed and and Sean are like obvious options just because they're not going to be here next year. And then after that, it comes down to like, all right, pony up. OK, OK, OK. Let's uh, get off the trade deadline subject a little bit and then let's go to uh, Twitter wars. So yes. that flips i mean they're all over the game siri does one in new york fans boo him the second time he does it again people boo him what's your take on this whole thing soda then afterwards he's asked about it like oh you know uh, i i kept my i wanted to trot it to keep my quads healthy or whatever what's your whole take on this whole bad flip city thing Look, the whole thing for me is like, I just want you to be consistent, right? Like I want, I don't want you to show up opponents in the process. And Jose Siri and Randy Rosarena, whether you agree or disagree, and I, I it's fine. If you don't like what they do, I, look, I get it. But um, they have always done this and it has nothing to do with you as the opponent. It has everything to do with them and like how they feel and what they want to do in those moments and feeling good about themselves. So I don't, I mean, I don't care about any of this stuff. You know, I, I firmly have the belief if you don't like it then don't give up the Homer. Um, and just like, you know, Juan Soto took a sweet, sweet, look, Jose Siri and Randy Rosarena, they take their sweet time around the bases. Juan Soto has every right to send it right back to them and, and <laughs> laugh in their faces doing it. So I'm all for, I'm all for it. Like I'm all for the drama. I'm all for the antics. And uh, in the end, like the Yankees shouldn't feel special, right? Like these guys. Uh, I posted on on X the other day. Like Randy Rosarena did his arms folding thing down nine to two in the ninth inning to the Braves. Like mm -hmm. it just it's like it's what he does. It's what he always does. It doesn't matter about the opponent. So you ain't special. And it, it's just like it's not about you. It's just something that they want to do. And you can agree or disagree on that. Like, that's fine. I, I certainly understand the people who are like, man, Surrey's hitting 200. Like, just run the bases. Like, all right, whatever. I disagree, but, like, I, I, I'm not going to say that I don't see your viewpoint. It just it is what it is. Last one for me. Uh, talk about bat, fl uh, bat flips and slow home run trots. What about raising your fist in the air and – saying fight fight as the walls did and drew a lot of attention from that as people surmised it was a 
Donald Trump endorsement. Then he came out later and said it was just a joke and didn't really mean anything. What do you make of this whole shindig? I mean, it was, he's not saying it's an endorsement. It was definitely an ode to, to Donald Trump. I, you know, look, again, when you factor in like the politics of everything, I want to stay so far away from everything. <laughs> but I, I do I do think that, um, I think John Romano of the Tampa Bay Times had a really good um, opinion on the situation, which is, was it the right time and space to do something like that? Probably not. Did he do something that was so like egregiously wrong? Absolutely not. You know, does it certainly make fans angry if you don't support Donald Trump and you hate him? Absolutely. Which which could put the Rays in a very compromised position of having one of their players hated by their fan base, right? So that's the whole like song and dance of things it, when you kind of like showcase your cards of your political leanings um, to which you are doing in those scenarios. But like to, I don't know, the, the fact of the matter is, if you're somebody who appreciates kind of like the free speech of it all of when, you know, when anyone in sports, right? Like they're the, long story short, right? There was the whole like shut up and dribble. And then like that side, then like praises Taylor Wallace for doing his thing. But at the same point, the people who were pro the, the whole comments that cause shut up and dribble, they're going to be anti the fist raising. It's like, we got to get out of the hypocrisy of it all. Either you're yeah. for it or you're against it. I don't care what side you lean, if you hate right. his political opinions or whatever. I just want consistency in opinion of acts and freedom of speech. So, yeah. you know, whatever. If you don't like Taylor Walls because of that, that's every part of your right. And that's kind of the, the crap Taylor Walls accidentally stepped in by doing it. And I, I think that him kind of like trying to diffuse it after the fact was like, oh, I didn't think it'd be like this. Um, right. So, yeah. but, but that's when you, when you take politics and you put it onto the grand stage, no matter what side you're on, you open yourself up to a Pandora's box of criticism. And maybe, maybe Taylor was a little bit naive to think what the reaction would have been to that. Um, but did he do anything wrong? Like, like, actually, like, no, he, he, he showcased his, his kind of, uh, you know, his standing for uh, what had happened to Donald Trump and, and sort of the, the perseverance he had in those moments after the assassination attempt. And people don't like that. And that's okay, too. I, like that, that, that you, you, if you, you like, it's not, a, it's not a hundred percent approval rating and what you're doing out there, it, it's going to cause divide. And that's the one thing that I'm sure raised brass, you know, any, any sports organization, any organization, business organization, for the most part, they don't want to create divide with their consumers. And, um, and, and, and Taylor kind of stepped into a little bit of that political arena, um, whether he knew it or not. I, I yeah, think and I don't think Taylor Wall should be naive to the fact because he's made other statements and sure. had other moments yeah. uh, that have put him in the spotlight for better or worse. I mean, we know just by before Taylor Walls did in that game, we knew where he stood politically. So he should have at least had some sort of inkling that it, people were going to write about it and broadcast about it and so forth. I'm just saying. Yeah, but yeah. but honestly, what Evan, I I agree. It's it's the consist the hypocrisy is what gets me more angry than whatever act is going on the field. The hypocrisy on the people on on, on social media and like it's it's you were just clapping the other thing and now you're you know you're going. To, it's kind of like the bad flip city thing. The Yankee fans are complaining that Siri does it, and then when Juan Soto does it or when Verdugo does it against the Red Sox, they're like, yeah, this is awesome. Like the hypocrisy bleeping kills me man yeah by the way Juan Soto is like I don't know if it changed after that whole game but I looked it up Tampa Bay like hilariously is slow with home run trots like Jose Siri was number two in Major League Baseball Randy Rosarena was number three Josh Lowe takes a sweet time Yandy uh, Yandy takes a sweet time. all of them take yeah. a sweet time running the base like it, it's it's well they don't funny. hit a lot like, of them fun. nowadays so yeah, they gotta so they have to enjoy them yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they really do like Cadillac it, but uh, Juan Soto was 25th in Major League Baseball. So it's not like he ain't taking a sweet time either. Like he was, 
I mean, he's he's an upper echelon of people that 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 likes to enjoy his home run trot. So what you know, like whatever. Uh, um, we will have baseball trivia and name that war coming up next. But first, we have to tell you this: get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trades. Supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. A complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry leading service as well. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com slash TM and order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com. All right, boys, getting into baseball trivia and name that war. Where's that music of ours? Got it. Night driving. Very good. My trivia question is race related. And we were talking about Jess Musson perhaps, maybe, possibly, one day being the future closer of the Rays or closer in waiting or a closer when Pete Banks or somebody else gets injured. In front of me, I have a list of the top 10 career saves leaders in the Rays slash Devil Rays organization. I want six of these names. Easy. We got this. Okay. Career saves leaders? Yep. All right. Um... Ulysses, you want to start? Fernando Rodney. Uh, that would be correct. He is third on the list with 85. Um, is Diego Castillo up there? Did he do it long enough? Mm, is that your guess? No, I don't no, think no, he would it's be. not. No. Uh, I'm talking with I'm talking with my guy over here. <laughs> okay, you're consulting. Um, pitch clock, pitch it, clock. Has, has Pete Fairbanks done it long enough? I think he could be up there. Pete Fairbanks. He is number five on this list with 59. Okay. Uh, Alex Colome. Alex Colome is number two on this list with 95. Um, I'm thinking that like Soriano or uh, Soriano. First name? Rafael. Rafael Soriano is number six on this list with 45. I'm going to go with uh, with what I hoped Garrett Clevenger would be. It might not happen. Jake Bleeping McGee. Jake McGee is not in the top 10. Strike one. What? Uh, Roberto Hernandez? He is the clubhouse leader with 101 saves. Numero uno on this list. I need one more name. Okay, okay, okay. We need one more name. Which, I mean, we got Troy Percival as an option. Um, we got Benoit was a setup man. Then after I'm Rob, trying to think, I'm trying to think back to like the really like, like Yen. Yeah, something like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go with it. Troy Percival. Troy Percival is number nine on this list with 34 saves. Very good. Got the six names, one strike. It is Hernandez, Colome, Rodney, Danny's Baez, number 471, mm. Fairbank, Soriano, Brad Boxberger, Boxberger. number 743, Esteban Yan, number eight. Ah, Percival, that nine. was who I was thinking of, not you. Yeah. Same. Yeah, Got you're me. thinking of uh, money, currency, yen. Yeah, yen, yeah. Not yen. yeah you got uh, it. Too. Lance Carter. Lance Carter uh, is yeah. number 10, who's actually the um, the brother of Nick Carter, Aaron Carter, if you didn't know that. So. Um, uh, there you go. Jan also had a home run. So that's a fun fact that you can take that to the bank. Uh, he hit a home All run. Right. I think it was in. Uh, I hope Shea he State. is not our name that war. He would. He, Please, let's not make him our name that way. He is not, because what I did, I was like, okay, who are the Rays playing uh, during this weekend series? And they'll be playing the Cincinnati Reds. Kevin's 
Cincinnati Reds. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I said, okay, when was the last time? Like, if you're a millennial, you really don't have a lot of memories of the Cincinnati Reds as a powerhouse. Okay. Well, you just don't. So I went back in the history books and I found the uh, last sir, uh, Adam Dunn, Brandon Phillips, powerhouse Jr., as Sean Casey, as Scott Rowland, need I say as, more? As a team, baby, as a okay. team, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. not a playoff powerhouse, right? Very so, 84 oh, win. 84 wins is basically what you banked on during the millennials. That's a really good season for the Reds if you're a millennial. Anyway, the last time I went back, when was the last time they were close to the World Series? And LCS. And that was in 1995. And in 1995, guess what? They had an outfielder. Pretty good. That's my uh, that's my tip for you. He was pretty good. Okay. Name that war is when we take a player from the past and we try to guess his career war according to baseball reference only using a baseball archive mind. And today's name is Reggie Sanders. Oh, my God. What is uh, Reggie Sanders' career war according to baseball reference? I don't really have a good beat on how many years he spent in major leagues. I mean, I, I'm going to guess like 8 to 10. Uh, oof. Um, oh, man. This is a good one. This is a real good one. Didn't he play for the Royals as well? He did for two years. Um, when I, when I really don't have a good idea, it's probably just best for me to fling out a number there and hope for the best. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with an 18 two. Okay. All right. I'm going to go a little bit higher and say 20, just numbers rumbling in my head, played 10 to 12 years, 270 career batting average, 215 homers. 150 stolen bases, fill in the blanks with the runs, the RBIs, the hits, so on and so forth. Probably at a OPS plus of like 104, 108, something like that. 20 is his career war. All right, hands up, Klosky, hands up, Weiss. No looking it up because this man had a slash line of 267, 343, 487 slug. That's an OPS of 8. 30, an OPS plus career of 115. Hmm. He did not have 200 something home runs. This man had 305 oh. home oh runs God. with 304 stolen bases. Look at that. One away from being right up matched. That's awesome. 17 years in the league, people. Yeah. Holy crap. His he might be the most league. underrated player in baseball history by this metric. It's Nobody insane. talks about him. His career war is 39.8. Yeet. Bleeping oh, Sanders. Good one. And I had no idea. That is incredible. Wow. That is, I think, the most I've been, I've been, I've undersold somebody or been so like far yeah. off of just like, even like the years, I would have never guessed 17. That was amazing. When I, when I was like uh, just researching this, I was like, damn. He was incredible, man. He was incredible. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. My bad. My bad, Reggie. All That's good. He's still, uh, up. Yeah. He was in great shape the last time I saw a picture of him. I'll actually be at the Rays game on Friday, Jimmy Eat World concert at the Trop. So there if you want to collaborate, hang out, have a beer, buy me a beer, buy me some other things, uh, I will certainly invite that. Just Do you know where up. to find um, You know where to find Kevin? Where? At the Budweiser Somewhere Porch. In the- no, somewhere in the middle of the trap. <laughs> somewhere in the middle of the trap. Ah, I, I thought you were going to uh, go. I thought you were going to go for a parking lot joke there. So no, I just went that's what I thought too. Yeah, Jimmy Eat. I just went with some Jimmy Eat world humor because I don't get to do it often. That's my well, ironically, joke. I did not buy the wristband because I'm not paying thirty bucks to get there a little bit closer on the field. I can just watch it from my seat. Like, what's the point? And that makes no sense to me. Yeah. But I will be leveraging my discounted inside parking deal that uh ulysses has illuminated me with and some other close people as well but i'll be at the game if you're interested in talking for a minute or two locked on gmail.com or send us a john instagram or twitter evan quickly who is one rookie or one player in training camp 
that is going to stand out this year? Uh, Jalen McMillan, wide receiver for the Buccaneers. He's the third wide receiver right now. Uh, I just think Mike Evans talked about how polished he is as a route runner already. I think he dropped in the draft due to injury concerns. If he wasn't injured at Washington that final season, I don't know if he makes it to the Bucs in the third round. I think that he could be a potential successor to Chris Godwin. I'm not saying he's going to have like a 1,000-yard one, 1, season here. But Jalen McMillan is going to quickly uh, fall into the good graces of Buccaneers fans. All right. Um, and then how can people find your work as well? 1010 Bay Plus, 1010Bay.com, at Eklosky, WTSP. Hit me up with any questions you got. I'll respond to 99% of them as long as you're not in the jerk uh, and hanging out in that right. 1%. So, Like it. Um, all right. That'll do it for this episode. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. Be safe and enjoy some Rays baseball this weekend uh, while you can enjoy some of the players that might be traded before the season or before the trade deadline. There we go.